For Cathcart. Oh, Cathcart. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to City Council Study good Session. Uh, Council Member Cathcart is going to be joining us in a little bit, but we're going to get started, and Council Member Mum is not joining us. Um, so our agenda today, we're going to have a discussion about the various uh, legal and technology requirements for us to get back to um, regular in-person meetings with the ability to participate virtually, uh, both for members of council and our boards and commission, as well as members of the public. And then we're going to talk about um, an AR, some ARP staffing, financial issues. And then we're going to finish up with the annual report from the Citizens Transportation Advisory Board from Shauna Harshman. So let's start with in-person. Um, and we have Mike Piccolo uh, as lead on this. But we also have Sarah Nuss, who's our... Um, I never know your exact title, Sarah, but your uh, disaster, emergency planning, all these things, and COVID, you've been there. And then we also have um, City Administrator Johnny Perkins to talk a little bit about what the mayor's plans are for reopening City Hall and things like that. So, But I think we'll start with you, Mike. What? How do you see things in terms of getting back to in-person and yet trying to keep that virtual meeting option going? All right, can you guys hear me this time? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Better than Monday. <laughs> I do hear an echo on my end, so I apologize for that. I'm not sure what's going on with that. So uh, the first of the month, I sound, sent out an, an email where I attached the latest information from MRSC, which included the action by the governor, taking steps to reopen Washington. So with that, we still have the requirement from the governor's proclamation to maintain the remote access for the council meetings, as we have been doing for quite, quite some time now. We still have the option for the in-person attendance. Fortunately, the requirements for the in-person attendance have been reduced, where before we still had a lot of questions, a lot of steps had to be taken, but now the requirements are fairly minimal. Uh, they removed any restrictions on capacity. There's no requirement for physical distancing. But the only requirement we have now is that officials, city officials, and employees who attend the meeting are subject to the LNI requirements uh, for masking, which are going into place right now. So if you are vaccinated, you can not wear the mask, but you have to verify that you are vaccinated which HR has a policy in place. And again, if you are an official and employee and you are not vaccinated, then you are required to continue to wear a mask at these meetings. For the public, there, the only requirement is that we post a notice saying, if you are vaccinated, masks are not required. If you are not vaccinated, masks are still required. Just like you see when you walk into the grocery stores, uh, MRC indicated that the, the, the city could take steps to have those citizens verify whether they're not vaccinated, or whether they're vaccinated. That's an option. You know, there's some hurdles with that because you are touching on a person's privacy issues. Uh, OPMA provides that a person has a right to attend a council meeting without any restrictions. They can walk in the door, sit down, attend a council meeting without any prerequisites to sign in. And so it, it, it is kind of kind of a difficult situation. Uh, if we follow the path, like businesses, grocery stores, where you post the signs and people are expected to conduct themselves accordingly and you just leave it at that. So that's, that's, that's the only requirement right now. Again, the in-person is optional. We have a lot of boards and commissions that are set up to do just the remote, at least you know, through the end of the month, kind of waiting for the council's lead on this. Uh, and I, I know there's been a few entities that have done, gone to in-person. One of them is community court. They have been having in-person attendance at community court on um, Tuesday mornings for some time now. But uh, so that, that's, that's where we're at. Uh, before I get to Sarah, who is the director of emergency management, 
Thanks, people, for getting me those notes. Um, my understanding, I think you mentioned this, but I think this is the, the rub for us on the technology, is that um, even though anyone can come in person, we still have to maintain an ability for people to participate um, not in person. And I think we, one of our challenges, we only have um, one phone line into council. Um, and so that makes it challenging for us to do that. And then um, in the past, we've been using our WebEx or our Teams type of technology to um, allow council members to appear if they feel like they need to appear virtually. That takes up that line. Um, so it's challenging. But could you just talk a little bit more about what's required as far as um, uh, outside access, which I don't believe we had under the OPMA before the governor's proclamations? Correct. Pre-COVID, the there was no remote access required. There was some remote access made available for council members who cannot attend a meeting, primarily the ability to call in. Uh, they're on vacation, on business, out of town, or just couldn't get physically to the council chambers, they could call in. And the, uh, the OPMA recognized that. All, all the articles from the MRC recognized that was acceptable. As long as the council member could hear everything, see everything, and everybody could hear the council member. So there's complete communication. With COVID, the only requirement for the public is that they have the ability to call in and listen. That's the only requirement. Obviously, with the city council, you have council meetings broadcasted on Channel 5. Uh, you can stream them on the Internet. Okay. I believe the council has made other accommodations for people to be able to call in and actually testify, which is more than what is required under the current remote protocol. So with the public, it's the ability to call in and listen. That's the only requirement. Now, how you accommodate staff and council members, uh, I think that the common practice is a WebEx type of capacity. Okay. So if I'm understanding, we have to have a means for the public to view um, or, or to listen by calling in um, and possibly we can, um, but, but they don't have to be able to testify remotely. So we don't have to do that unless we want, I mean, we may want to, but we don't have to Correct. do that. Correct. Okay. And, and does the call in, does it have to be telephone or if we're streaming live on, uh, city cable five, is, is that it? Or does it actually have to be a, a telephone call-in number? It has to be a telephone call-in number. Okay. And I think the reason for that is perhaps the governor's office felt not everybody had a computer at home or access to a computer, sure. but most people have some type of access to a cell phone, a landline, something where they can at least call in and listen. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Um, Sarah, I'll, I'll turn to you. Well, first of all, any questions for Mike so far from any council members? Council Member Kinnear. Did I miss, or did you talk about distancing? Is there a requirement to distance? Yeah, I, 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 I can did, take that I, on okay. if, if you'd like, Mike. Sure, go right ahead, Sarah. Okay, thanks, Mike, for all your input, and thanks, everybody, for having me. Uh, yes, so we have reviewed the rules, and as far as spacing goes in public meetings and in general uh, in internal meetings at City Hall and other city facilities, uh, there is no social distancing requirement anymore. Uh, so we have removed the tape and the markers in all of our meeting rooms and have returned some of the chairs. Uh, I did speak with facilities and some other folks and recommended that, you know, in the interim until we get kind of back to what we, what used, we used to be before I showed up at this job, that we, you know, have folks sit a chair apart, things like that, if we can. I don't think there's any need for us to be sardined, uh, but as far as social distancing goes, that is no longer required. Mm -hmm. Other questions so far? All right, Sarah, what, what else would you like us to know about um, yeah, Thanks. I'll just recap of the two reopening kind of things that we're at. You know, we've worked over the last uh, over a month here getting our staff ready uh, to be able to come back, you know, getting used to using their 
uh, equipment again. Uh, many folks forget their passwords. I certainly forget mine. It's required to be changed all the time. Uh, getting used to using our computers and printers and uh, you know credit card scanners, things like that. Getting used to being around coworkers again, even though we're all sort of cross-staffed. Um, We've been working on that over the last couple of months, and the potential opening date for the public is going to be August 2nd, which I believe has gone out to staff and the public. That just gives our, our staff just a few more weeks to work out child care, transportation, considerations for parking downtown, uh, working with their supervisors. We're you know, in a hybrid model where we've in, uh, empowered supervisors to work with their staff to decide how best to deliver the services at the level that our community expects from us whether that's you know, in person, a blend, you know, whatever that looks like, we're, we're giving some freedom there for that. And as far as masking goes, it's been discussed already, but the process is following LNI guidance where there is an opportunity for anyone who would like to voluntarily uh, you know, volunteer their vaccination status to work maskless, and that can be done in two classified ways. One was interacting with our safety uh, personnel who work in HR to just flash your information. It's not recorded anywhere. Uh, confidentially, and then the other option is to use our PeopleSoft internal employee portal to toggle a switch that articulates that you are vaccinated. And again, no one else has access to that. It does not violate HIPAA, except for HR has access. Um, so all meets the LNI guidance for our employees. We've updated signage in all of our facilities. Uh, as Mike articulated, it's similar to what all, everyone else is doing, uh, county government and businesses alike. You know, uh, vaccinated folks should wear masks public wise, obviously employees are still required if they're unvaccinated. Um, the option is there to wear masks. We're encouraging that just because, you know, there are outbreaks going on across the country. That is pretty much the highlight. Questions? Council Member Stratton. Just a quick question. Are, do we have somebody in city hall tracking this variant now that they're talking about? So if we have any of that Coming into City Hall, or we have um, employees that are um, getting that. I mean, will we have somebody watching that for us? A really great question. Thank you for asking that. So I am engaged directly uh, with the health district. So I stay in contact with them about what Delta variant, that's the particular concern right now that we're seeing across the country, not here yet necessarily in large outbreaks, but I'm in contact with them. Additionally, HR does a weekly COVID outbreak report with me. So if that were to be something that came at me and several others, if, it, if we see any outbreaks among our staff or their family or things like that, we will also know. But yes, I am the point of contact with the health district and we'll keep everyone apprised to any outbreaks or risks and I work closely with our communication team uh, about getting that information out. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, and hang, hang on the line there because we might have more questions for you. Before. Uh, Mr. Perkins, any, anything you want to add from city administrator position? Thank you, council president, members of the council. I, I just want to thank uh, the staff and the team that developed this reopening plan led by Sarah Nuss. Sarah did an, has done an incredible job, continues to do an outstanding uh, job of representing uh, our city as it relates to emergency management, but her leadership really made this plan come to fruition along with uh, the team that she put together, Marlene Feist, Matt Lowmaster, Mike Hornsby, Thea Prince, Mike Sloan, Megan Steinolfson, Tanya Wallace, Jeff Teal, Stephanie Crawford, Kirsten Davis and Brian Coddington, you know, this was outside of their normal day jobs and they were all committed to meet whatever time of day during the week or on the weekends that was necessary to make sure this plan came to fruition. So again, want to thank uh, all of them as well. Again, Sarah's incredible leadership for guiding this group. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, I have some questions for council members. Um, and some of them are, you know, what's your ideal preference? Some will be limited by technology for a while while we, we continue. Um, we, we've been migrating towards uh, Microsoft Teams, but it doesn't have a call-in option for events yet. And we also have some technology limitations in council chambers still that we're working on. So I'm going to ask for some discussion about people's goals, and then we'll try to get them accomplished if we have a, a weight of opinion in a direction uh, as soon as we can. But it might not be as easy as discovering what we want to do. There might be more things to do. So the first one is, uh, do council members want 
to preserve what we have right now, which is the virtual option. So I'm imagining either August 2nd or sometime later in August, we'll be back to full in-person meetings and room for everybody on the dais to sit here. We're not going to be on our computers. It'll just be the regular microphone system and the regular cameras. So we'll, we'll start that sometime when we get our technology right and the public will be able to come in under, you know, the conditions that have been outlined. Uh, if they're unvaccinated, they need to wear masks. If they're not vaccinated, they don't need to. And their social distancing rules go away. Although if there's people who are unvaccinated, we'll hope that they will keep some social distance. But so that's coming up. But the question is, is it important for any one of you or all of you to keep the option for virtual appearances, um, just like we've been doing. So there may be uh, reasons why you might want to appear virtually, just like we do on these meetings most of the time. Do we want to keep that in place as an option, uh, as opposed to simply only having the uh, telephonic um, appearance that we used to have? So that's my question. And I see Councilmember Cathcart has a hand up. Go ahead. I would just say definitely we should retain it uh, in some way. I, I think the telephone system is so antiquated. I don't think that that makes a lot of sense. But I think the virtual option, especially if there's some conflict, we're out of town. I mean, I think it's important that we have that ability to still represent the citizens we're here representing. And, and just because we're out of town and have to miss a meeting, uh, a virtual option would allow us to still participate and, and, and do the best we can to represent uh, our folks. So I would love to have a, a, a virtual option that's preserved. Does does anyone have a contrary opinion to that? Yeah, no, nope. that sounds good to me. And it also for people who are formally appearing in front of us, it gives them options and whether or not they actually live in Spokane, we might need them. So, so that's helpful. Again, there's some technology uh, issues that we have to work out. It they're doable. It's just uh, we it, we have a big enterprise and we have to have to figure that out. So we'll go towards that direction. Not sure if we'll have that option in place on the first time we're back to normal in-person meetings, but we're working on that. A second question I have for you all is, um, I'm imagining you know we'll have briefing session and council in person, but do you also want to have our study sessions and committee meetings in person? Again, everyone on the dais who can make it and open to the public in chambers. So opinions on that, or do you want to go slower and work that in later? Council member Kinnear. Well, I, I'd like to address the piece about where, because we've had this conversation for years, actually, about um, filming our committee meetings and our study sessions. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are pros and cons, but I think it's beneficial to the public when they can see what we're doing. So it's not the behind the scenes stuff that people imagine we're doing. It's right out in the open. So I, I think it's important that our our committee meetings and our, our study sessions be televised. Whether we do it in person right away or not, I'm ambivalent. I just want to have our goal be towards having um, them televised. Okay. Other thoughts? And I'll, I'll just, Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, I would just somewhat agree. I mean, I, I kind of ambivalent. I think committee meetings, uh, just being that they're the same day as our council meetings, probably makes sense that they'd be in person, um, but I could certainly see study sessions perhaps at least for a little while, um, maybe remaining virtual or, or having that option, but um, but I kind of ambivalent on, on those, but I do think, you know, the council meetings themselves uh, definitely want to be in person. Other thoughts? And I just wanted to add, we've long before uh, COVID, we've discussed that we would like to have the best of both worlds, which have it televised, which we can do in chambers, and then have a more informal uh, 
council members closer to the people uh, conversation in the briefing center that isn't camered up. So, so this doesn't preclude going in that direction and eventually making the briefing center into a smart room and making that a lot easier. Um, and perhaps we may want to spend some of our ARP funds doing that and making it easier for um, the public to access this. So uh, that this doesn't do it. But I'm imagining for the uh, near future, we'll be having our briefing sessions and our committee meetings in chambers so that we can film them. I think people have really enjoyed that option and being able to watch it whenever they can, even if they're at work, when the meetings are there. So I, I think that's been really good. Um, another kind of related question, I'm just looking for a poll of people. If uh, Again, I don't see us doing an in-person meeting until City Hall is open because we would have to deal with security and things like that. But August 2nd would be the first meeting, and I'm just wondering, um, is everyone who's on this call, would they be appearing in person or would you need a virtual option for that? Um, let me put it, let me ask this way. Is there anyone who would not appear in person on August 2nd who's on this call? Okay, all right. Good, good to know. Okay, another question. I don't have too many more, but, uh, and that is, um, again, because we were doing it on using WebEx, it was easy for the public to uh, testify remotely uh, because of the WebEx platform that we have. And so we could figure out how to do that since all council members were on WebEx at the same time. Um, it's more difficult technology-wise, if I understand it, if we're in person, to allow that to happen. Uh, but we could achieve that eventually. It might not be in the first few meetings. But my question for you, I'm interested in your thoughts of, do you like the idea of people being able to testify remotely by phone? Uh, which, it, you know, there's pros and cons on it. Obviously, it makes it easier. And that's also the, the con, potentially, is that it makes it so easier that people don't take the time to actually come down to the meeting and that. But I haven't noticed any huge surges of uh, public testimony, although that could change if we have a controversial issue. So just wondering, again, technology, we may not be able to do it right away, but do you want us to go in that direction so people could testify in person or testify by phone remotely? So just looking for comments from folks on that. I see a thumbs up from Councilmember Burke and I see Councilmember Stratton's hands. I think it's a good idea. I think it's whatever we can do to make it easy for people to participate, um, that's great. So I would support that. I'm ready to come back in person, but you know, there are people who have, this is just a much easier way to do it. So I don't have a problem with it. The only problem I have is that I don't want to get sick again. So if we have any other um, um, cases that are that are out there, it would be nice to have that balance. You know, if one of us needs to stay home or somebody's traveling, like Michael said. So I know it, it's going to be a little bit harder technically, but it would be great to have that option for the public and for council members okay. and staff. Thank you. I see Councilmember Kinnear. I am going to agree with Councilmember Stratton. I think we do need to give that option to the public. I feel like we're entering the 21st century finally. And I think it's really important that people have, I know, right? I think it's really important that people have different ways they can communicate with us. So, and different ways we can communicate with each other. So, yep, I'm, I'm sign me up. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Wilkerson. And I will just continue to echo that. It is like the new norm. It's like when we got to testify in Olympia and we could do it from here, how that increased participation. So I just think giving the community options of how to engage with their electeds mm -hmm. is always the best route to take. And I look forward to being in person since I was only in person for like a month. So <laughs> I'm welcome to get back. All right. I saw Councilmember Cathcart nodding and had a chat message from Councilmember Burke. Okay, 
we'll, we'll continue to go in that direction again. It might not be on day one. Um, uh, and then the other question staff had was um, mask requirements for the public coming in. And I, if I understand the interpretation is, well, I guess there's two levels. One, we can require everybody to wear masks from the public. Uh, two, we could just leave it on the honor system. And three, the other option would be uh, checking um, verification of people's vaccine cards uh, to make sure that they had one before they were maskless. And again, just asking for people's thoughts on those. I think those are really the three options. Um, so I think Council Member Burt put in the chat uh, either masks or asking for the, uh, masks for everyone or asking for the cards. And I see Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, def definitely the honor system. I don't think we have the staffing or, or really the, the wherewithal to be asking everybody their vaccination status and checking vaccine cards and all of this. And, and I think it is a bit of an invasion of privacy to be asking those questions. So I think uh, letting people, you know, operate on the honor system uh, and following the science. I mean, if you are vaccinated, you're not going to, you know, be spreading this. And so to require those folks to be wearing a mask doesn't make sense either. Okay, we've got two somewhat contrasting opinions on that. Any other views? Well, Councilmember Burke, go ahead. Sorry, I saw your hand though. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say that if we can't agree on this, I feel like everybody should probably just wear a mask because Council Member Stratton is correct. The variant is out there and um, you can get it and spread it when you are vaccinated. So it's, we need to be really careful about that. And I don't want to get sick uh, and I don't want to continue to spread this um, uh, COVID variant anywhere else. So I think either, like I said, we but if we can't agree on the three options, I think it's just everyone should wear a mask then because that's what we know is safest. Council Member Kinnear. I, I'm going to uh, side with Council Member Burke on this. Just cautionary. We, there's a lot we don't know, and I'd rather not get sick either. I'm vaccinated, but we really don't know what's out there and how long the vaccine will be effective. So I'd rather see everybody masked up during our meeting and not, I, you're right, it's an invasion of privacy to ask. So let's just all put on a mask and not worry about whether you are or you aren't. Um, Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, I would just say if we're requiring everybody to wear a mask, we're effectively telling folks who are unvaccinated, there's no point in getting vaccinated. I mean, if we don't believe in the science of vaccination, then I just don't, I just don't understand why we would, um, we would do that when we're trying to encourage more people to get vaccinated. So then uh, one thing we could do is say when we're 70% vaccinated, then everybody doesn't have to wear a mask. But until we're 70% vaccinated, we're not there. We don't have herd immunity. We're still going to have the variant and it's still scary out there for people. So, um, uh, you know, I, I'm happy to put that in there and saying, you know, if we uh, if we get as a population, if we get to 70 percent vaccination, then sure, no mask. But until then, we don't really have the option or luxury to um, to do that. And we we're not at 70 percent. So. Councilmember Wilkerson. Uh, could I ask Sarah if she could give us. Uh, the number where we are at with our vaccination status. I thought I saw 70% of the paper, but I'm not sure if that was correct. No, Spokane County, I will look right now. If you can pause, then I'll come right back. But I believe we are hovering around the 40% range. Just one sec, I'll grab it. I think we got a long way to go for that one, but... <laughs> The 70% was statewide, Councilmember Wilkerson. Well, statewide, um, okay, but, um, which is great that we got there statewide, but it varies in counties. Councilmember, or 
I feel like most of that's due. Sorry, most of that's due to Seattle because they hit seventy um, percent, yeah. and they're a large portion of our population of yeah. Washington State. So King County seventy eight percent. Council member, or not council member, Mr. Piccolo. Well, we're waiting for Senator. Just, just to follow up on this question, I'm looking at the MRSC article on their website where they say. We confirmed with the governor's office that there is no requirement to verify vaccination status of in-person attendee to determine compliance with the mask order. However, local governments can opt to do this at their discretion, keeping in mind that any employee elected official in attendance will be subject to the LNI guidance. So I think from that, yes, we can ask for verification. I, w- I, I would like to follow up with MRC on the ability to say, no, we're simply going to make everybody wear a mask when you come to, to the meeting. Because I know what the, from the LNI guidelines and the governor's office, when you are out in public, that wearing them, if you are vaccinated, you do not have to wear the mask. Mm-hmm. Uh, so grocery stores, businesses cannot make you wear a mask under the governor's guidelines. Let me double check with MRC on that one, one aspect. I can get back to the council very quickly. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I, I thought grocery stores, it was up to the grocery store. They could require it if they wanted to, but outside. I, I, I think so. I think you are right. But let me just double check with MRC. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, okay. it's, it's not going to be, uh, at the earliest, it's going to be August 2nd. So we have a little bit of time. Right. Um, okay. Sarah, I don't know if you found any numbers. It was, so is in the article today in the spokesman, um, yeah, sorry about that. The state's dashboard just takes forever to load. I'll put it in the chat when I've got it. Okay, great. Councilmember Stratton. So just a couple things. Um, I will say, if I say paranoid, I am. Um, we are dealing with a situation now with a, a, a friend who is in a retirement community. They have gone back to shutting everything down because they had two people vaccinated that have tested positive. You know, they haven't come out and said that it's the variant, but it's it, it makes me a little nervous. Mm-hmm. But after listening to everybody, maybe we just keep it that, that people that want to wear masks wear masks. I mean, I don't mind wearing a mask just to be safe if council members want to do that. But maybe it's a, if we can't force everybody to wear masks, then maybe we just use our own um, decision to decide to wear a mask or not. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yep. Well, I'm super glad to hear from you. We, we can, we have the legal authority to make everyone wear a mask. It's just, and it's a question of whether we choose to do whether that we or use not. That. Yeah. And there's yeah. pros and cons, but that's well, why. I'm happy to not force everybody to wear a mask. I can wear a mask and feel like I'm at least safe. So that would yeah. be my choice. Okay. And I think others could make that choice too. Yeah. Well, I believe Sarah could correct me that masks, if you wear a mask, it doesn't protect you. Uh, it's, it's the people wearing masks are protecting us, everyone else from themselves. But um, we saw in the chat. That is correct. I'm... Yeah. Um, the, in the chat, Spokane County, 53.6% of eligible residents have received at least one dose. I, Sarah, I don't expect you to get this done um, right now, but it'd be interesting to know how the city fits into that. I, we usually report it by county, but I don't know if in your, in your, all the work that you're doing, uh, if you can find a place where it's by city, it'd be interesting to know how we're doing as a city. That would, that would be helpful to know. So, um, yeah, I can reach out to the state and certainly ask that, um, SRHD might have it as well. I'll get back to you. So, all right. And council member mom isn't here. So, you know, it sounds like we're all on the same page on everything but this one, so that's good. And uh, we have another couple of weeks to talk about it before it uh, gets there, and we'll get a little more information from Mr. Piccolo, possibly from Sarah on how the city is, and hear from Councilmember Mum. And uh, but on the other ones, I think we have pretty clear direction um, on what direction we're going, and it'll just be a question of when we're able to phase it in. As you might know, we're off on August 9th is our, our, our annual uh, summer week that we encourage people to take vacations on, and we're not meeting that week. So 
uh, that gives us yet another week. But we'll see how far we get on August 2nd. And we'll be in touch and we'll have a mother, more conversation about this in, in this group, maybe at next study session. Um, uh, Councilmember Burt, I saw your hand. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say that um, as somebody who I, I've had a lot of health issues this past two years, and um, I, like Councilmember Stratton, am really uh, paranoid about getting sick and um, have done everything I can to protect myself. I don't know that I would necessarily feel comfortable coming in if we didn't have a mask policy. And so, um, you know, I know we did talk about having some um, televised uh council members being able to come in. So mm -hmm. I would really, if we're not going to do the mask thing, I would really like that option because I, I don't want to be forced to go into a room of people that I don't know if everybody's been vaccinated or not. I will uh, amend my notes to take that into account. So a fair point. Thanks. Um, anything else on our meetings, masks, uh, general Opening City Hall policy, we've been getting good updates from Mr. Perkins on how that's going. But if anyone has any questions on any of that, let me know. Otherwise, we'll move to our next topic. All right. I'm not seeing any. Um, all right. It's great. We have Chief Financial Officer Tanya Wallace here. Uh, we've been arm wrestling a little bit on this next issue, but um, I think the common ground is we recognize that uh, if we're gonna uh, deploy $80 million of American Recovery Plan money from the city's allocation over the next three and a half years, uh, we're gonna need at least one person in financial compliance, we're gonna need a project manager, and we're gonna need um, a community engagement uh, person. So there's three different positions. And I think we have agreement to have the compliance person in CFO Wallace's um, department or division. I'm not sure how we actually call finance. It's several things. And then the other two are in council. And based on the legal advice and analysis we've had so far, we thought the council positions, because they're administrative functions, not legislative functions, could be um, uh, funded by ARP dollars, um, but there's a difference of opinion from uh, Chief Financial Officer Wallace, at least at the moment, and I think she'll tell us a little about that and what her um, ideas are for getting uh, bulletproof clarification so that we don't end up having to pay money back. Um, so we'll hear a little bit from that, her on that. I mentioned to City Administrator Perkins yesterday that uh, we could initially fund the project manager and the community engagement just from general reserves uh, while we get that worked out because we're, we have project, we need those functions in place right now because we need to we have projects coming in that we need to manage with the project manager and we have a lot of community engagement to do uh, with that position um, so I, I think we've talked about this before at other meetings and there have been emails flying around that's my tee up but um, I definitely wanted Chief Financial Officer Wallace to just give us her thoughts on this to start with and then we can go from there so welcome Tanya hey okay, thank you Thank you, Council President, and good morning, Council Members. Um, yes, there has been a great deal of discussion over, um, over this, um, which should not be um, construed in any, any way. This is going to be a generational opportunity for this region and across our country. This is some of the biggest pieces of legislation that have come through for generations. So we do need to proceed. We do need to have the debate we do need to have the discussion and proceed very carefully. Um, there is agreement that the city needs support going through this. Um, I am seeing only, only recently, like in the last week or so, a lot of cities already starting to hire uh, specialist positions. They're hiring senior grant specialists. They're hiring consultants. 
they're hiring legal support, and they're hiring senior financial analysts for evaluations and assessments that are going to be required um, for every project. So we are starting to see the hiring occur. Um, and certainly for jurisdictions that are greater than 250,000, they are required to actually put a performance plan together and report on that. Um, that will be Spokane County. Spokane City is under that threshold, so that requirement um, is, is, is it's not required for us, but it may be something advisable that we want to proceed with. So like Council President said, there's definitely agreement that at this time, we do need financial analytic support for reporting, for evaluation, just to create um, forms. We need administrative support just to do that. Um, and yes, there is definitely support that's going to be needed for community outreach and regional coordination. Um, we do need to identify what these unmet needs are that were directly attributed to COVID. We need support. We need help. And we all completely agree on that. So why we've been having um, discussions of should this report into the council office, should it report into um, the finance office, the mayor's office, where should it report? I would really encourage all of us to not get hung up on that right now because that is not what is really important. What is important that we get the support that we need to move forward. Um, in order to clarify whether it's legislative, administrative, and some of those details, we have searched the frequently asked questions with U.S. Treasury, and it is not clarified yet. It is also not clarified in the final rule. So. I put in a direct request to the U.S. Treasury to get some clarity around this. I am sure that other jurisdictions are going to start asking similar questions, which is probably why it has not yet come up on the frequently asked questions. But we are going to get clarity for us. Um, we all want to move in the same direction on this. So um, certainly the council has the proposal in front of them. Um, it, was put, it was put there in June. We've been discussing it through July. Um, again, if we can just move forward and recognize we do need the support. The city needs the help. There is not enough staff to support this generational opportunity. And we're going to need consultants. We're going to need experts in the area of federal grants. Um, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to giving you the presentation on Monday that will get us all started and give us as much information as we have right now. And we're going to continue to develop a plan to make sure that we all stay on the same page as new information comes out. So with that, I will be quiet now. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. Uh, so Tanya, uh, being an old grants person myself, usually there's a percentage of grant money that is set aside for administrative fees or administrative costs. With this ARP money, what would that look like and where would those set aside dollars be? I hope I'm not jumping ahead of your presentation on Monday. No, no, you're definitely not. Um, the presentation on Monday is going to be a little more higher level and not quite much into the details mm -hmm. because we can develop the details later. But that is a great question, council member. And it really kind of depends on what our recovery plan is and what the projects are. Various projects will demand more assessment, more reporting, um, and will have more requirements. If there is more, then we will need more administrative support. So it really is, we're, we're just going to have to stay flexible and stay fluid on this. The standard in federal grants is limited to 10%. That would be about $8 million for the city and more than $10 million for the county. Um, I do know, I believe it was, it was Seattle. Um, in the, many of their programs, they designate 5%. And that's so it, it really just, over costs. 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so it really does just kind of depend on what our recovery plan shapes up to look like and how complicated those reporting requirements are for those specific projects. Yeah, there and there. I don't know. When I think about that, and be good to get some information. There's, there's kind of two levels of administration. It, a lot of the money is going to go to other organizations to deliver the money, and they're going to have admin costs. And so it's kind of our admin costs, their admin costs, and and what the formula is for calculating. Because you could quickly exceed 10 percent by by the city taking 10 percent, and then the next organization taking 10 percent, and things like that. So that'll be important to get figured out. Other questions? Tanya is coming on uh, Monday to Finance Committee to talk some more. Um, but I see Councilmember Kinnear. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this. I want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence, certainly. and. Tanya's team is the best equipped to do that. Having said that, I want to make sure that as a council, we're overseeing the process, that we are we have the final say as to how funds are distributed. This isn't, we're, we're gonna be collaborating. However, somebody has to make the final decision because it is it involves funding, it involves budgetary items, it involves money. It's my opinion that the council should have the final say. And I want to make sure that throughout the process, we have a voice that is considered, maybe two or three voices that, is, that are considered as we're going forward so that we're not drowned out. And I don't know how to set up a mechanism whereby that would take place. It's going to require trust. It's going to require transparency. Uh, so I think we need to think about how this is going to look and how we're going to go forward. This is a lot of money and we need to get it right. I completely agree with you, council member. Um, I, and I also agree because of the magnitude of this and the impact it's going to have on our region we need to be more communicative, more collaborative, um, and ensure that everybody is on the same page as we move forward, not just between the executive and legislative branches of the city, but also with our other regional partners that are out there. Um, exactly what that is going to look like. I, I don't know, and it's going to take a full team, including council members, to design what that process is going to look like so everybody's needs are being met. And yes, city council, we fully understand that you are the authority or you will be the group that grants us the authority to do what we need to do for our citizens. So you are definitely a player in this, a huge player. Thank you. Um, it sort of reminds me of, you know, when your rich uncle dies and doesn't leave a will and all the relatives have, are squabbling over the millions that he's leaving. And I don't want that to happen. I think we really need to be um, thoughtful going forward. And I, I think the communication starts right now. So let's not wait for, for us to get together, form a committee, do all this stuff. Communication has to start right now. The trust has to start right now. So that is my ask. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I would just say I think uh, I know there's some debate on on where the staff is housed and and who they report to. I would just love to see some agreement with the two sides, uh, so that one of our current staff members is just a part of this internal committee. Uh, of folks to include these new hires that, that Tanya is talking about, and we would just be able to collaborate and always be in the loop with one another on on these conversations. Um, and I I definitely, as a council member, want to be a part of these conversations um, to every extent possible. But the other thing I was going to add too, and to Tanya's point about collaborating regionally, 
I think it'd be sure great if we had some sort of a regional task force that included the other entities that are also getting some ARP dollars so that we can find if there are some economies of scale or some some areas where we could, you know, best put dollars together, whether it's a school district, the county or otherwise, um, and, and really have those robust conversations. I know I submitted my list or at least a preliminary list of, of requests. And I think two of those uh, has the potential for some overlap or, or maybe some you know, opportunities to work with some of those other regional partners. And so we need to have them at the table and have those conversations as we as we proceed. So that'd be my thought. Yeah, great point. And just so you know, um, Eric Polson has been deployed to, ident to identify the people at each of those regional partners who's the lead on that and to start to get those conversations and look for those overlaps. So yeah, we're, we're thinking the same way. And to Council Member Kinnear's point, we, we, you know, we did a resolution, we set out the process and the process is we have a very wide net at the city council level to accept any ideas from council members, community members, the administration, and then the project manager position is, is getting those uh, in a coherent way. The council's uh, three member team is going to uh, organize those and send them. We're every um, study session starting kind of starting today because we're starting on this one little piece. But in the future, every study session is going to have a section to consider uh, nominations of what council's um, feedback is. And for ones that seem to be um, have strength of support, they will then go to uh, the collaboration group between the administration and council members to work out things. And that's exactly what's going on here. So, you know, we... Uh, are talking about these three positions, uh, one in the administration, two in the council, um, and we're getting feedback from the administration on grants compliance of, hey, we need to make sure uh, that we can use ARP funds for that. So we're, we're doing that, and then once we get that feedback resolved from the administration and opportunities for partnership and leveraging and other ideas, then it will come back to the full council for a vote. So it'll come to the council twice. On the front end, is it worth exploring with the administration? And then on the back end, should we approve it? Um, and so that's, that's what the rhythm that you'll be seeing. And so there'll be a lot of chance for collaboration with the administration on, on projects that the council has given kind of a thumbs up, worth exploring with the administration on. And the administration can submit those to the council uh, work group on that as well if they want things and we I would say well over a month ago sent an email open invitation please send us any projects any ideas that you have and I believe the administration um, uh, is working on that so far I think they haven't wanted to do it piecemeal they want to do it as as a group I think is my understanding so we haven't been getting uh, piecemeal ones but we did decide uh, that we do want these three positions and we can, again, have a project manager position and a community engagement position without using the ARP funds. And I think that's what we're going to vote on on Monday. But we need them in place right now because we need to start that community engagement. So that's what it looks like forward. So I talked with Mr. Perkins about getting a slight amendment to the SBO to make it clear that uh, we're going to fund these two positions at least out of general reserves for the time being until we get uh, the green light that everyone agrees in grants management, we can do it out of ARP. Uh, and if we don't, then we, we we can't do it, but we'll still have those positions working. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, just on the community engagement side, I'm just wondering, has there been any official outreach to the, the neighborhoods on asking them to, to provide some input on ARP dollars? I know I bring it up at every neighborhood meeting that I'm at, and some know about it, some don't. So I'm just not sure if there's been any official communication or how they can best provide that input. And then also, I also think some sort of simple web portal where just anybody in the community could, mm -hmm. you know, uh, provide their ideas or, or input on the ARP dollars that we could promote and push push out there through our channels would be uh, just something some easy, simple, beneficial for the community to provide that input. 
Yeah, that's totally in the works. I think the short answer is to yeah. date, there hasn't been a formal, but I asked Hanalee Allers to talk a little bit about uh, Thought Exchange and what the work she and Lisa are doing uh, on that topic. So I think you're prepared to go on your... Yeah. Um, Council President... Can I say one one quick thing? Yep. Um, I just want to remind the council that ARP dollars cannot be used to replenish reserves. Yep. Yep. That came out in the final rule. Um, so, yep. so again, if we just proceed very carefully, we've got the request into the U.S. Treasury. Um, maybe we find an alternative from using reserves just so that we don't get ourselves in a position that we didn't really want to be in. Yep, no. Our reserves are very a very precious commodity, and we're facing another year of revenue shortages and possibly mm. another year thereafter. Yep, no. I'm aware of that rule, and so even if we put a chunk of reserves for those staff positions, we won't be spending very much of it, so we can put it, put it back. But, yes, you are correct that... Any money that we spend on staffing uh, to help us start on the project management and community engagement from reserves, we can't put back into reserves. But it won't, assuming we get our answer within the next few weeks, it will be minuscule uh, compared to what's um, going on. But, yeah, I do, we do know that um, limitation. Uh, but I think at least from the council team that we've been working on, is we really can't delay any longer. We need to start um, getting going. This money is going to have the biggest impact the sooner we spend it because it will mm -hmm. multiply over uh, years. So, But I'm glad you brought that up. And now, Lori. I, I just I have to have the last word, right? So, and um, Tonya's right. These reserves are very precious and those of us that have been on the council a while know just how precious because we scrimped and saved to make sure that they are there. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think we need reminding on that. We know exactly how precious they are and mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we preserve them. Um, for me, it's like my own personal bank account. Like don't touch those. Mm -hmm. I understand there are times when you have to, but when you, when you work so hard to make sure you save it, you want to preserve it unless there's an extreme emergency. So thank you for that reminder. Yes, we know. And yes, we're going to be good stewards of that money. All right. Ms. Allers. Okay. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, I put in the chat a link to a thought exchange that Lisa and I worked with the thought exchange team on putting together that we would... The goal, the goal for this would be to send it out to neighborhood councils, different community groups with a like sample email they could use to distribute to their connections and groups to try to get as many members of the public as possible into this. Um, we can make changes to it. I ha it is technically live, so I do ask that you guys don't share this until we have fully finalized it, but it's the way that we can make sure all of you can view it and let me know if you have changes. So that link is in the chat. And if you look in there, it will take you in as if you are a participant in the exchange. And there's a couple of brief sort of demographic questions about whether you live in the city, what district you live in, that kind of thing. And then it's just a very open-ended question on what are people's priorities for spending this money. And there is some background information as well in an introduction that people can read as well as some links to more information. So the goal is to try to give people a quick primer, but then get their ideas. And then once people are putting ideas in, they can go in and vote them up or down so we can kind of get an idea of what the most important things are to members of the community. And then we can take those demographic questions and split it up to see what are the most important things to people who live in District 1? What are the most important things to people who own businesses in the city? So there are some options there as far as how we play with that data later. 
and this would just be advisory to you and to the work group. This isn't necessarily, this is how we, you guys will definitely allocate the money, but it's just meant to be information that's helpful. And then we can also do exchanges further down the road that are narrower in scope. So if you all decide that you want to allocate money to a certain area of the community, be that like a certain um, group of service providers or that kind of thing, we can do further exchanges that have narrower questions and get different feedback as well. So um, it's a pretty cool tool. As you guys know, we have not used this yet except in our council retreat a few weeks ago. So it's pretty exciting to see how this how this could work. And I'm, I'm really curious to hear what feedback you all have. So you can send that to um, Lisa and I, and we can get this updated. And as soon as it's ready, we can get an email drafted to be sent out and start getting feedback from people. Yep. And what I love about Thought Exchange is that it's so interactive with everybody who participates that you not only get the ideas from people that we might not have thought of, but you get everybody's reaction to the ideas that do. And it just kind of builds. As long as you get enough people uh, participating and it just continues to build and evolve. Um, so it's, you know, we're just starting out with it. The school district has used it for years on all sorts of different issues uh, and they found it pretty darn helpful. So that's the start of it. And as Hannah Lee mentioned, there's both the kickoff of, hey, everybody, tell us what you're thinking about, but we can then, as we get specific, like let's just say we want to replace playground, we want to replace 10 playground structures. We can just literally push that out to the whole list of anyone who's participated in it, and then we'll get real-time uh, thoughts on that um, as well. Or we can push out a question of, uh, t you know, two things. Should we help uh, downtown businesses more, or should we help the neighborhood associations like Garland, East Sprague? You know, wh where do you think the need is? Uh, of course, the answer is both, but if we have it. But, but you can do those sort of things and get people's temperature on things. So um, questions, so, oh, go ahead. Um, just, I just want to reiterate, please don't share this out yet because we'll just remove responses until this is fully live. We don't want people to think they're participating before we have it um, out and ready. And please, if, if there are ideas you have for those demographic survey questions and things we could add, please let me know on that because that can be really useful. We don't want to have a ton in there that overwhelm people before they get to the actual exchange, but whatever you think might be helpful, we could add something. Council Member Stratton. So is there a way that people can have guidelines before they do this? I hate for us to get in a situation like I feel we're sometimes in is we get their feedback and then we say, oh, we can't use it for that. We can't use it for that. We can't use it for that. I mean, is there a way to get some of the guidelines? I mean, I know this is complicated, but it would be nice to have some kind of a something yeah. for people to read to say, well, maybe we can use it for this and it's worth looking at. But I don't want to get in a position where we're just getting all of these great ideas and then be told we can't use it for that. Well, we do have some background information there right now, but um, I'm sure Hannah Lee okay. and Lisa will take that feedback into account and see if there's any other, you know, kind of quick summaries of things um, that we really can't do. It's, it's pretty wide open, but there are some things. So great feedback. We'll, we'll look into that. Council Member Wilkerson. I was, thank you, Council President. I was just going to say I had this conversation with Tanya uh, to ask her for some general guidelines mm -hmm. uh, of where this money and how it can be used that mm -hmm. could be put out there so we're not encouraging people to start thinking about things that would not mm -hmm. qualify mm -hmm. and get their hopes up. So I think Mr. McClatchy is also working on that. So I, I think it, it may be something we include in the thought exchange just funding guidelines. Yeah, we are going to get that on Monday. And then I'm imagining to both of those points and to Councilmember Cathcart's that we will have a, a web page dedicated to this that will both allow people, regardless of whether they participated in the thought exchange to give their ideas, 
but lots of link, lots of frequently asked questions, as, you know, as best we can do without um, giving abstract legal opinions, just, you know, so that people have those resources and make it easy as we can for people. But that's also going to be the job of the engagement person when they're out in the community is for them to become as expert as possible on those topics so that with their uh, meeting with a neighborhood council or a nonprofit group, they'll be able to give them that guidance in real time and encourage them. Because we're, you know, we're hoping not to just be passively having a website and launching surveys. We're hoping to actually be out there in the community uh, encouraging people to be engaged and, and, and listening to them where they're at on their terms. So that is part of that person's job that we haven't hired but hope to hire soon. And to Tanya's point in the chat, she makes a good point that, you know, even if you get ideas in here that are great ideas that might not be eligible for ARPA funds, it could help highlight something that you want to find another funding source for. Okay, any more questions, comments about ARP, thought exchange, uh, Monday's vote to fund the, the, at least the project manager and the uh, community engagement positions with some reserve funds initially until we get that answer, so we'll have to update that or amend that SBO to do that. Um, all right, well, Shauna Harshman's been here. I'm sure she's interested in this topic, but she's mainly here to give us her annual report from the newly constituted Citizens Transportation Advisory Board. So Shauna, take it away. Thank you, Council President and members of Council. Um, my presentation for you today is quite brief, but I did bring um, together um, a short PowerPoint to just highlight some of the information that is in the annual report that I sent out to all of you yesterday. So let me share my screen here real quick. All right. So we use the Transportation Benefit District annual report really for two different purposes, high level, we're trying to keep the public um, involved and apprised of the great work that's happening in residential street maintenance that, that comes about because of the $20 car tab. And so the report um, goes over the revenues, the expenditures, the projects that were funded, and, and construction cycles. And then the second purpose of the report is that the uh, Revised Code of Washington says that we have to do um, this report in addition to a financial report. So two birds, one stone. A um, couple of differences though, if you're looking at the report this year as compared to other years is um, I really updated the style and, and format of the report. And I did that for a couple of reasons, not just to make it prettier, but I want to have this report available for the public, and, and they need sometimes to have things that are more visually appealing, that have infographics that are easier to understand. And so I really put an eye towards that so that we can have a, a nice-looking document to put up on the website that's easily accessible and and really set up the format so that as we move forward with the Transportation Benefit District um, changes that you recently approved, then we're set up to be able to track those changes. How many, how many unpaved street miles did we add? Um, so what's the pavement condition index of our, our streets overall? And you'll see some of those changes in, in this report. The only other bigger change here is that we've moved uh, the two-year plan for street maintenance projects, which you approved by resolution back in December. We've pulled that out of the annual report so that what you'll see is probably about four months into the new year, you'll get an annual report on the work of the Transportation Benefit District from the previous year. 
And then late in the year, you will have come before you that, that project list. We're also making some changes to that that I won't get into now. Historically, you've looked at a two-year project list for residential street maintenance, and we're moving to a six-year cycle to better align with the, the project timelines in the other street programs and we understand that those out years are really uncertain and there's been some hesitation in, in making that move. But as long as we frame it appropriately so that folks understand what they're looking at, uh, we think there's some good value in that. So for 2020, what was the TBD doing? Well, because of the I-976 there was a lot of uncertainty regarding the Transportation Benefit District funding. And so no meaningful um, projection of TBD revenue or expenditures for 2020 was able to happen. But near the end of the year, what, when it became clear that funds would be available, we got the CTAD meeting again and um, taking a look at the existing financial status and to start that planning work for 2021 and 2022 that you all have approved. And so the bottom line is that all of the project accomplishments for 2020 were funded by sources other than our Transportation Benefit District uh, dollars. So on, on this slide, just a couple of things that I wanted to bring forward to highlight for you that in 2020, the funds collected um, did increase over 2019 from just over 3 million to 3 million 350,000, essentially bringing the, the revenue for the TBD um, to date for the program up to $26.5 million. So I know that we hear um, daily the very real concerns of our community members on our residential streets and, and needing to do more, but this $26 million that we've seen over the program live has been able to accomplish quite a bit. And we'll just continue down the road and, and track it and, and look at that over the, the next five or 10 years and, and get more done. So um, I won't go into the details over the, the program obligations, meaning the projects that, that were accomplished though they're, they're in the report. And you can see one of the things that's important to note here is that this residential uh, maintenance dollars goes to a number of different treatments. And so we see crack seal projects, we see chip seal projects, um, grind and overlay projects. There is dedication of at least 10% to sidewalk installation. And so you can see those projects there as well. And um, Streets Director uh, Clint Harris has also been innovating and, and looking at some other opportunities for, for crack ceiling that is more affordable. And so we're, we're piloting a project there this year and we'll have some better data to report out on next year. Um, so some of the data that is in, in this annual report also um, tells you kind of the lane miles and which district that, that work was accomplished in. One of the overarching goals of the Citizens Transportation Advisory Board is to maintain balance between funding over um, the two-year project plan in each of the districts. And we did, for 2020, complete three rather large sidewalk projects. Um, the Driscoll from Wellesley to Bismarck, the Cincinnati Greenway, and then the 37th Avenue Manitou to um, Ottawa. So sidewalks um, are moving forward, some exciting projects coming up. And then um, part of what I'm doing is also compiling the project gallery so that we've got on the street um, pictures of what the street looks like before and after so that people can, you know, celebrate what's not necessarily a ribbon cutting, 
but that is important work happening in, in <coughs> our neighborhoods. And for the next project year, one of the things that we are working on is the creation of signs that go up on each of these project sites to let the community know this project funded by your transportation benefit district dollars. And then um, the, the last thing that we do is we just have a, a map of those projects that were completed by year. I told you I would keep it short and sweet, but i um, happy to answer questions about this. Yeah, Council Member Stratton. Yep. So are we going to make this available or can we send this report out to our neighborhood councils? Absolutely. After um, the meeting ends today, I will get it up on the web page and I'll send it out to all of you. If we still have the um, Friday update, I would ask to have that pushed out to neighborhoods. But I'll work with the communications folks so that we can get that out, out to people as well. Yeah, we, we have a distribution list um, that we can send out to the Northwest Neighborhood Councils. But it would be great for all neighborhoods to have that information. Thanks. Councilmember Kinnear. Yeah. Thanks. Shauna, remind me, what's the percentage that uh, is devoted to sidewalks? Is it 10%? Well, we say a minimum of 10% will be devoted to sidewalks. And right now, um, we're really averaging around 12%. And then without getting too much into the weeds, there was some desire to look at the ADA um, ramp installation and how to classify that. Um, and so we're doing some additional access work with the ADA ramps that's not captured in our um, sidewalk percentages. But just okay. so you're all aware. I, I just, thank you. I really encourage us to uh, stretch that as far as we can within reason because our sidewalks are in such terrible shape uh, in every neighborhood, in every district we have, our older neighborhoods have issues with sidewalks, and that goes towards certainly equity in our um, our older neighborhoods, but also, you know, kids getting to school, people who have mobility issues, it's in getting to a bus stop. It's so important. So I would encourage us to really take another look at that and how much we're spending on sidewalks. Thanks. And, and just so you know, um, Shauna's been reforming the CTAB, but she, are, she already has a preliminary proposal that we've been working on for 2022 and 2023 of money allocated by the CTAB to really, really upscale and upgrade our sidewalk replacement fixing projects. And it would be scaled by income. So at certain levels of income, the city would just pay for it. At the next level, the city might match 50-50. At the next level of income, the city might just provide low interest loans. So there are significant dollars already allocated for that, but we haven't filled out the, fleshed out the program yet. So that's coming and there's potential for ARP to come and then make that even more. And we also need to upgrade the um, local improvement district language that we have in the code that would allow people to uh, band together and get economies of scale. Uh, th this idea of just doing one little sidewalk project at a time is so expensive per square foot and we need to figure that out. So that is all coming. Shauna's going to be working on that this fall and be presenting to us and back in touch with us. So, so yeah. Actually had a meeting about all of those topics with um, Public Works Director Marlene Feist and Policy Director uh, Brian Masachi just last week to really start digging into creating those programs. Yep. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. I was just going to first just thank Shauna um, for her work. We get a significant amount of calls about roads in our neighborhoods and uh, the history and the knowledge of the state of those roads and being able to respond to citizens has really been a lifesaver to me as a district rep because um, she shared the map as before. A lot of our roads are really old uh, and really need some investments. And our citizens are asking, well, why are the main arterials getting something, but 
you know, I have a small lake in front of my house kind of issue. So just thank you, Tanya, for being a resource for that. And I just look forward to maybe more education, how we can continue to keep that out front for our citizens to help them understand uh, our kind of convoluted government process of how we do road repair and construction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, all right, any other questions for Shauna? All right, well, we took a year off CTAB projects, but that gave us more options to uh, better leverage those dollars. So excited, and we have, you know, a, a retool, thanks to council, Shauna's recommendations and the former CTAB, we have a retooled board with more community representatives and uh, priority on engagement with the neighborhoods, which wasn't necessarily happening that just really wasn't in their job description uh, for those folks and now is going to be. So I think uh, between that and retooling traffic calming, which is going to happen this fall, it's going to be a new day for uh, neighborhoods. So thanks for all that. Okay, I, that's the end of our agenda today. Is there any anything else for the good of the order? Anyone has? All right, then we will be back Regular schedule Monday, it's finance and administration committee meeting at 1.15, then briefing at 3.30, legislative session at uh, 6. Not a, not a robust legislative, though. I think we'll get out of there early uh, as far as the legislative thing. Well, at last I looked. <laughs> so, all right. Well, take care, everyone. And if you can't take care of somebody else, uh, we are adjourned.